Hi everyone. I'm sorry that I missed last week's video. I've been struggling with the channel and its direction. As you all know, I go through phases of being copyrighted or a family member of a case contacting me to give out to me and have a video taken down. As you can imagine, this is very disheartening. Even though I stick to the facts and I'm as compassionate as one can be towards the victims and their families. I get all my information from the public domain and bring it together in one place to tell their story so they are not forgotten. The only time I'm negative is towards the perpetrators and our failed justice system that is from the guardie to the courts. But anyway, rant over and on with this week's case. Today our case brings us to a townland just north of Sligo Town in County Sligo which can be found in the northwest of Ireland. Sligo is an affordable county and has everything from beaches to mountains and urban life is almost within touching distance. It offers a comfortable pace of life in a beautiful corner of Ireland. Frederick and Mary Mann were from Sligo and had moved to England in 1969. They got married there and had 10 children. Melissa, their youngest, was born on the 10th of March 1992. The family had their struggles. It wasn't easy raising 10 children. Unfortunately, two of the Mahan children had been placed on the Child Protection Register in the UK and three of the other children had been placed in foster care at one time or another. The Mahan family would visit Sligo often, even returning there to live in the mid-80s, but soon returning to the UK once more. In 2005, Mary's father died and she returned home for the funeral and this time she wanted to stay for good. She felt at that time it would be better for the family because of the growing threat of terrorism in London. Her husband Frederick soon arrived in Sligo with the youngest children, Melissa, Liana and Yvonne, and they all settled in Ratbrahan Park housing estate just off the old Bundoran Road outside Sligo town. Melissa and Liana settled in quickly and soon they made friends not only in school but with the girls that lived on the same housing estate as them. Three of these girls were Heidi, Samantha and Shirley Dunbar. They also had returned from the UK. They were around the same age as the two youngest Mahan girls, aged between 13 and 15 years of age. Melissa and Heidi became fast friends especially, as they were in the same class in school. But all three girls hung around together, Melissa, Heidi and Samantha. When the three got together, anything could happen and it was hard to distinguish who was a bad influence on who. They tended to skip school and were even accused of trying to break into a house in Sligo Town. This would be the first time Melissa would be noticed by the Gardaí. When the three were confronted by the Gardaí at this time, Melissa was described as scared and the two Dunbar girls were described as bold as brass. Melissa and Liana would mostly visit the Dunbar household to hang out and very rarely did they go to the Mahan home. They would hang out after school and at weekends. The Dunbar's girl's father, Ronnie, would take them for drives in the countryside, bringing them to local beauty spots around Sligo. And this is when Melissa was first introduced to Ronnie Dunbar. Ronnie was from Sligo originally and was born in 1964 and was one of a very large family. In the mid-80s, he moved to London, met and married a woman named Angela. They had one child together, a little girl, but things would go sour between them. Soon, Ronnie would start up a relationship with a young girl of 15, who used to babysit his daughter. Her name was Lisa Conroy. They would go on to have three daughters together, Heidi, Samantha and Shirley. But again, this relationship would end. Lisa would later say that Ronnie was incredibly abusive towards her, but never towards the three girls. When she first met Ronnie and began babysitting for him and Angela, his then wife, Lisa was in the care of the state and had not been treated well at the children's home she lived in at the time. She said that Ronnie was like a saviour and made her feel safe. She also said that Ronnie was very into his looks and was always checking himself out in the mirror. He went to the gym a lot, smoked cannabis and took steroids to beef himself up. Lisa also said that he was very controlling, abusive and had even raped her on one occasion. Finally, when she had enough, she left him after a severe beating that nearly left her dead. 
she fled Ronnie after this beating, leaving the three girls behind. Lisa did return for the girls, but Ronnie wouldn't let her take them, and eventually she lost custody of the girls. Even though Ronnie won custody, he was not a father of the year type. On one occasion, he had a run-in with the local drug dealers and they turned up at his door. He slammed the door in their faces and shots were then fired, hitting Ronnie and his nine-year-old daughter Shirley, who was hit in the leg. When Ronnie gave evidence in court against the man who had shot them, he was put into the UK version of the Witness Protection Programme. The family were moved to Scotland and were given new identifications. They were now the McManuses. But Ronnie couldn't keep his head down and became a nightmare neighbour. He would constantly fight with his new neighbours and the authorities had no choice but to kick them out of the programme. With nowhere else to go, they returned to Ireland and to Sligo. Ronnie's criminal history dated back to 1981, from violent assault, robbery, theft and drug charges. With all these crimes, the most he ever spent behind bars was three months and that was for stealing a car. As 2005 progressed and the new year approached, Leanne and Melissa's sister noticed that she and Ronnie were getting a bit too close for comfort. They would sit close together or lie on the couch together. Initially, Leanna didn't see anything wrong with it. Ronnie was still acting like a grown-up, even banning Melissa from his house after she misbehaved there. Ronnie was well-liked by his daughter's friends, but Leanna was moving away from hanging around with her sister Melissa and the Dunbar girls, as she had made her own friends by now. Melissa, on the other hand, was spending more and more time at the Dunbar house. By July 2006, Melissa would run away from home for the first time, and her mother Mary knew exactly where to find her daughter. She woke Leanna, and the two went over to the Dunbar house. When Mary knocked on the door, Samantha opened it and immediately shut it in their face. After a minute or two, Ronnie opened the door to Mary and Leanna and told them Melissa was not there. Not taking this as truth, Mary insisted on going into the house to search for Melissa. Eventually, she would find her and Samantha in the garden shed in their night dresses giggling. Mary gave Melissa a quick slap to the face and marched her from the shed, through the house and home. This didn't deter Melissa. The next morning, she was gone again. Mary waited the whole day for her return, but she didn't. She had a fair idea where she was. Mary waited a week for her daughter to return and when she hadn't, she called to Dunbar's house once more. Ronnie answered the door and told her he hadn't seen her at all, but that he'd keep an eye out for her. After this, Mary saw Melissa around the estate twice more. A few days later, on the 4th of August, Melissa returned home with her hair cut short and dyed black. This would be the last time Mary would ever lay eyes on her daughter. Melissa would leave again and this time Mary rang the Gardaí and reported her missing. What I didn't explain was in March 2006, Melissa had come to the attention of the Child Protection Agency due to her truancy from school. She had been assigned a social worker to help her get back on track and they were to put a plan together during the summer school holidays to get her ready for school in September. A home visit had been planned for the 10th of August and Mary managed to delay this visit until the 22nd of August in the hope that Melissa would have returned by then. But when the social worker turned up on the 22nd, there was no sign of Melissa. Mary confessed that Melissa hadn't been home since the 4th of August. The social worker was not happy. Mary told her that she had reported Melissa missing to the Gardaí and that she thought Melissa was staying at the Dunbar family home. And so the social worker insisted Mary go to the Gardaí once more. When they spoke to Gardaí, they explained that Mary had reported Melissa missing on the 4th of August, and she thought that she was with the Dunbars. Garda Conway and the social worker decided to get to the bottom of this, after sending Mary home. Melissa, being only 14 years of age, added to the worry. Garda Conway knew Ronnie Dunbar personally and felt sure that he would be willing to sort things out with him. When the social worker and Garda Conway called to Ronnie's house, he told them that Melissa had been at his house on the 3rd of August, but had no idea where she was now and that he would ask around. 
He also offered for them to search his house, but Garda Conway declined. Shirley, Ronnie's daughter, said she had seen Melissa at an amusement arcade, but hadn't seen her since. The next day, Ronnie called to the social worker's workplace, asking for her number and telling her that he had been in contact with Melissa and she wanted to talk with her. The social worker spoke to Melissa and she seemed willing to meet up at her place of work. But the following day, Ronnie spoke again with the social worker, saying that Melissa did not want to meet her at her workplace, but a secret location that Ronnie would drive her to. But the location would not be known until last minute. There was to be no guardie involved. The social worker was reluctant, but she also needed to know Melissa was safe and well, so she agreed. Ronnie picked up the social worker and he drove her out to an isolated wood to meet with Melissa. Samantha, Ronnie's daughter, also went with them and when they all met in the woods, they greeted Melissa as if they had not seen her in years. The social worker thought this as bizarre but put it aside. Her only concern was getting Melissa home. The social worker offered her two choices, either go home or go into a residential care home. Melissa, on the other hand, wanted to be fostered by Ronnie and his then-girlfriend, or the people who she was staying with then, although she wouldn't say who these people were. Melissa made out that she was being sexually abused by her father and that her mother was violent towards her. With describing the slap to the face she got when Mary found her hiding out in Dunbar's shed. Nothing could be resolved at this meeting, and so everyone went their separate ways. Over the weekend, Garda Conway and the social worker did their best trying to keep in touch with Melissa through Dunbar, in order to try and convince her to go to a residential care home. By Monday the 29th of August, Garda Conway and the social worker made an emergency application to the courts, to give the power to the Gardaí to remove Melissa from the Dunbar home and put her into residential care for her own good. But Melissa turned up that same day at the residential care home of her own accord, along with Ronnie and his daughter Samantha. Lisna Nog in Sligo was an open halfway house for troubled teenagers in care. Boys and girls between the ages of 13 and 18 years of age stayed in this four-bedroom house. They were allowed to come and go as they pleased, except for a curfew of 10pm. On the first night Melissa stayed there, the staff agreed that she could visit the Dunbar's house, as long as she was back by 10pm. She was dropped off by staff at the house at 8pm, and when they checked her room later, Melissa was there. But over the next number of days, she would spend all her time at the Dunbar's house, and had to be forced back to the care home. She just did not settle and therefore couldn't benefit from what was on offer to her there. She never gave it a chance. On the 5th of September, a team meeting was held in order to try and help Melissa. It was decided to restrict her visits to the Dunbar house. Ronnie was asked to attend a special meeting to get him to comply with the plan. Melissa's family would not attend this meeting, but were kept informed as to what was happening concerning Melissa. Melissa's family were not happy about having her back after the accusations made by her towards her parents Mary and Frederick about the abuse. Mary told the social worker that if Melissa was to turn up at their door, she would get a hiding for what she had said against her husband and herself. Other accusations, though, had been made by Melissa's siblings while they were living in the UK years before, although nothing was ever proven. The last accusation was made in 1992, the year Melissa was born. Over the two weeks Melissa spent in the care home, she only spent six nights there. If she wasn't at Dunbar's house, she would be out with other teenagers, drinking and abusing solvents. The Gardaí were contacted about her nearly every single day after the time she entered the care home. By now the social workers were at their wits end when it came to Melissa and the Dunbar family. They applied to the courts for a no-contact order between the Dunbars and Melissa, but this backfired big time, and so it was decided Melissa needed to go into foster care. Melissa was picked up by Gardaí and brought to a foster home in Kinloch in County Leitrim. She was placed with an experienced foster carer, Jane, 
but that night Jane found Melissa outside in her nightdress smoking a cigarette. When she found Melissa outside, she began screaming at Jane and as she approached her, Melissa ran away. Jane had been told by social workers that if she ran, to let her and so she did. Jane phoned the social worker and the guardy and they soon picked her up down the road at a neighbour's house. Of course, Melissa had spun them a tale that she had woken up in a strange house, not knowing how she got there and that she needed to get back to Sligo. But the neighbours knew that Jane fostered children and there was more to the story than what Melissa was telling them. Melissa gave the number of Ronnie to the couple to ring him to collect her. But instead, they rang the guardie and the social worker turned up to bring Melissa back to listen and Oak, the care home. Now a new plan needed to be put into place by the social workers. When they had returned to the care home, Melissa went into the downstairs bathroom to change into clothes the social worker had bought her on the way home and the social worker went into her office to make new arrangements for Melissa. But when she went to check on her, she was gone. This all happened on the morning of the 14th of September 2006. Gardy were informed that again Melissa had gone missing. On the 15th of September, Gardy called to the Dunbar home to see if Melissa was there, but there was no answer. As they were leaving, they met a neighbour and asked them about the family next door. The man said no, that he hadn't seen anyone coming or going from the house and gave his name as Ronald McManus. What the guard didn't realise was he was actually talking to the man he was looking for and it wasn't until a second guard had turned up and recognised him as the man. They were looking for Ronnie Dunbar. Ronnie explained and apologised for the confusion and said he often went by his mother's maiden name and he had moved into the house next door the previous week. With Ronnie's permission, the guardie searched his old house and found nothing. Again, it was searched four days later and again on the 6th of October 2006. Ronnie, at this stage, was getting fed up and pointed out that Melissa had gone missing while in the care of the state. Melissa's family were not helpful in the search. They thought that it was the social services who were responsible for finding her. They wouldn't even give Gardy information on where they had relatives living in the UK. Ronnie Dunbar was not quiet while Melissa was still missing. He told the media that it was the state that was responsible for Melissa going missing, that the Mahan family didn't care about her and the Gardaí were not doing enough to find her. He made himself out to be the only caring person in Melissa's life, and yet he was the one being harassed. In November 2006, a reconstruction of Melissa's last known movements were made for the TV series Crime Call, in the hope it would lead to more information. Ports and airports were issued Melissa's description and photograph, in case she had gone back to the UK, but nothing was found. A year came and went and still there was no sign of her. In a renewed appeal, her mother Mary spoke of Melissa and coming up to the Christmas the following year again, another appeal was made. On the 31st of January 2008, Shirley Dunbar, Ronnie's daughter, was living just down the road from her father with her boyfriend and newborn baby. Samantha, Ronnie's daughter, was also living with her at this stage as Ronnie had kicked her out of the house. While both were on the phone to their mother, Lisa, who was still living in the UK, they got into a heated argument to where Samantha hung up on Lisa. Samantha broke down and told Shirley she was like she was because of a secret she was keeping. She told Shirley there and then that she had witnessed her father, Ronnie, kill Melissa. Shortly after Samantha revealed this information to Shirley, Shirley's boyfriend, Danny, returned to the house after being out all day. The two girls were visibly upset when he walked into the house and he could tell they both had been crying. He asked what was up and eventually Samantha told him that Ronnie had killed Melissa. She told him the whole story. That back in September 2006, a week after Melissa had run away from Lisnanog for the last time, Samantha had come home. Heidi, her sister, had opened the door for her but tried to stop her from going into the house. When she finally got in, she went upstairs and into the bedroom, where she found her dad, Ronnie, on top of Melissa with his hands around her throat. He jumped up when he saw her 
and Samantha went to Melissa to check and see if she was okay, but there was no movement from her. Ronnie left the room and came back with the sleeping bag and the two of them put Melissa into it, tying it with a necktie. They then took the body from the house, put it into the boot of the car and drove it to the river bonnet. As Shirley's boyfriend was taking all this in, she revealed that Melissa had been pregnant and she had been with her when she took the test. It was then Danny rang the Gardaí. The Gardaí weren't long arriving at Shirley and Danny's house. As they sat in the living room with the three of them, Samantha was described as in a trance state and Shirley was a mess, her makeup all over her face from crying. Samantha repeated what she had told Shirley and Danny that Ronnie had killed Melissa. With this information, the Gardaí brought the three of them to the Garda station in Sligo to be formally interviewed. As Samantha was only 16 and Shirley only 17, social workers and priests were called to be with them when they made their statements. The next day, Samantha agreed to take Gardaí to the area where Melissa was dumped. The sub team were called and a search of the river commenced. The search site showed up nothing and so slowly the team made their way downstream towards Loch Gill. On the 11th of February, 11 days after the search began, a member of the sub team found a piece of bone which was part of a human skull. Soon other pieces of skeleton remains were found. Also found nearby on the shore was a nightdress, a man's tie and a torn sleeping bag. As soon as Melissa's body was found but not officially identified, the media descended on Sligo town and surprisingly the Dunbar family were more than happy to talk to them. Shirley disclosed to them that everything she had told the Gardaí, including that her father had a sexual relationship with Melissa and she had been pregnant. Ronnie, in turn, decided that he needed to put his truth to the media and denied being a sex offender. He said he had been in trouble in the past, but he wasn't a pervert. He placed the blame for Melissa's disappearance firmly with social services and her family, of course, who had failed her, as he put it. He said that he had gone out of his way to help Melissa and she even called him dad a few times. He also tried to lay blame on his daughter, Samantha, that his other daughter Heidi had told him that Samantha had hit Melissa over the head with a rock when they had gone camping and that it happened around the time Melissa went missing. Ronnie also said he was being used as a scapegoat for the Gardaí's incompetence and social welfare's failings. All these interviews were conducted anonymously to the media by the Dunbar family. On the 10th of April 2008, these interviews with the media were halted when Ronnie Dunbar was arrested for Melissa's murder. The Gardaí in the previous two months had been waiting for the results of the DNA to confirm that the body found in Loch Gill was indeed Melissa, and it was. Along with waiting for the results, they investigated Melissa's life, especially the days before she went missing. The Gardaí received her mobile phone records, and on the day she last left the care home and the day she was thought to have gone missing, she had been in contact with Ronnie. His records had also been accessed and compared to Melissa's. They were in frequent contact, comparing his messages and phone calls to Melissa to that of his girlfriend at the time. 18% of phone calls were to Melissa, compared to 7% to his girlfriend. 52% of the text messages were to Melissa, compared to 21% to Dunbar's girlfriend. When Dunbar was arrested under the suspicion of the murder of Melissa, search warrants were issued for the two houses that Dunbar had occupied. Six pit bulls had to be removed first. Strange things were found in both houses. Old boxes with cutouts with binoculars inside were found and it was thought that these were used to keep a watch on who was outside the houses. There was also a box frame with a large hole cut into it that a small frame person would fit into, kind of like a hiding place. When Dunbar was brought to Sligo Garda station, he was not very cooperative. He told Gardaí that he had a father-daughter relationship with Melissa and anything else that was suggested was nonsense. Despite him not cooperating, the Gardaí and the DPP felt they had enough to charge him with Melissa's murder 
and so he was brought to a special sitting of the district court in Sligo and formally charged with her murder. He was then remanded in custody until his trial. On the 21st of April 2009, the trial began. The defence fought tooth and nail against every bit of evidence provided by the prosecution, except the evidence of where Melissa's body was found. Only 65% of Melissa's skeleton remains were recovered, as it had been 18 months since she had disappeared to the time she was recovered. Dunbar's two ex-girlfriends testified against him, along with his three daughters, Heidi, Samantha and Shirley. Samantha said that her father was having a sexual relationship with Melissa in 2006, when she was only 14 years of age. That Melissa had told her and when she confronted her dad, he admitted to it. When asked about the last time she saw Melissa, she told the court she had last seen her on Thursday evening, the 21st of September 2006. She described seeing her dad and Melissa in the upstairs bedroom on the bed and that her dad's arms were around Melissa and she was struggling to breathe. When Dunbar had got up and left the room, Samantha said she went to Melissa but she wasn't breathing. It was then that Dunbar came back into the room, put Melissa into the sleeping bag and all of them, Samantha, Heidi and Dunbar, drove out to the river to dump the body. All through this, Dunbar threatened the girls, telling them that if they told anyone, they too would be in trouble, as they had helped get rid of the body. Heidi more or less matched Samantha's story of what happened that evening Melissa was killed, even though Heidi had lied numerous times to Gardy over the years. After 21 days of evidence, both the prosecution and defence rested. Closing statements were made and the jury retired to deliberate. When they returned, they found Dunbar not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter. Before sentencing, Mary, Melissa's mother, wished to make a victim impact statement. And in an unusual move, Justice Barry White questioned the sincerity of such a statement from Mary. He questioned the investigating officer about the cooperation of the Mahan family or the lack of in the case. The detective confirmed that the Mahan family were not forthcoming with information to help find Melissa and had, quote, drip-fed them information. Even so, the victim impact statement was read out to the court by the prosecution. It read that the Mahan family had gone through a lot since Melissa disappeared and then found dead, that Mary and her daughters had self-harmed and attempted suicide. Dunbar never admitted to any kind of guilt, nor showed any remorse. He had an extensive criminal history. The age difference between him and Melissa was huge. He was 44 and she was 14 at the time she was killed. He went out of his way to cover up his crime and stood in the way of the recovery of Melissa, making sure if she was to be found, there would not be any evidence left to pin him for murder. With all this in mind, Mr Justice Barry White felt that life in prison would be an appropriate sentence. Only Liana, Melissa's sister, turned up for the sentencing. This is understandable considering the pillaring Mary and Frederick Mann got from the judge in previous days. On the day of sentencing, the judge revisited the subject again, stressing that he hadn't been including Melissa's brothers and sisters in his criticism but underlining the fact that if the victim impact statement wasn't treated with respect, it would become worthless and not serve the victims, the common good or justice itself. In 2011, Dunbar sought an appeal against his conviction and sentence. This appeal application was denied. In early 2012, Dunbar was once more in court, accused of raping his youngest daughter, Heidi. Dunbar was found guilty and sentenced to 15 years. He still sits behind bars to this day. Rest in peace, Melissa.